Welcome to Speak Out. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And today we have uh, our very action-oriented Westchester County DA with us, uh, Tony Scarpino, Anthony Scarpino, but better known as Tony, uh, to be here today to talk about what is going on in Westchester County in the District Attorney's Office, and it's such an important office. And can you just, um, you've been there now for two years, um, pretty much two years. Two years, yes. And, uh, but you had, you had done a lot of other things before that. Can you just kind of give us a little, how did you get to be sure. a DA? Well, I was, I'm a Mount Vernon kid, born and raised, went to Mount Vernon High School, and I, I, my, my goal was always to get involved in law enforcement. I wanted to become a special agent with the FBI, and that oh, was, okay. you know, what, what my dream job was going to be when uh -huh. I was a Did young, you do that? Person. I did have that you chance. You did? Oh, okay. So I went to college and law school solely for that purpose, mm -hmm. and uh, when I got out of Syracuse Law School, I uh, came back to Mount Vernon and um, I had put in an application for the FBI. Uh, it, it's a long process, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And while I was waiting, I was, got involved in local government. I became an assistant corporation counsel under the late Mayor Tom Sharp in the city of Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. And after 11 months as a, a city attorney, um, I, I was accepted into the Bureau. And I went down to Quantico, Virginia for training. Um, then I became a special agent, I was assigned to Kentucky. I was in oh. Kentucky for two years. Okay. Louisville, Kentucky, and then southeastern Kentucky. A little different than here? Very, Very different. different. <laughs> Certain amount of culture shock for both them and me. Right, uh, right. And then I was transferred back to Manhattan. In Kentucky, I was working criminal matters. In Manhattan, I was working espionage. Uh, I was an intelligence officer for two years. And then um, what happened was um, I, had, I was having all these moves and transfers, and I mm -hmm. was married now. Mm -hmm. And I decided that it wasn't the lifestyle for creating a family, mm -hmm. at least for me, I felt. So I left the Bureau, went to work for Bankers Trust Company for two years, and then the mayor in Mount Vernon invited me back to Mount Vernon to become a judge. And so mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was appointed as a city judge in the city of Mount Vernon, and then I was elected. And then from there, I had a 31-year uh, run as a trial judge, the city court of Mount Vernon, Westchester County Court, New York State Supreme Court, surrogate's court for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, after that period of time, I, I eventually left, went into private practice briefly, and then when uh, Janet DeFiori, my predecessor, uh, had the opportunity to go to the Court of Appeals and become the mm -hmm. chief judge, mm -hmm. uh, it created an opening to mm -hmm. which I, I wanted to get back in law enforcement uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and be back in public service because I missed it right, terribly. Right. I love public service. We well, are certainly uh, back in it now. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly, <laughs> certainly back in it now. So and it's great. You're right. So tell us a little bit about you know the uh, the district attorney's office is, is in White Plains, um, right near right kind of across from the courthouse, I guess. Well, we're in the courthouse, bridge. 111 Dr. Martin Luther King mm -hmm, Boulevard. Mm -hmm. We're there. We also are in the low rise mm -hmm. across the street. We have two floors there. We have three floors at uh, 111 Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard, the county courthouse. But we also have eight other branch offices to, uh, to handle the local court and, and, and the incidents that occur throughout the county. And they're in the major cities, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I usually forget one, but you know, there's one in Yonkers, and Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, White Plains, um, Greenberg. We have uh, Yorktown um, and um, Mount Kisco, Northern Westchester. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's all the major cities, and we have to staff them, those eight offices, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Westchester is very unique. It, it, we have over 40 municipalities, which means there are 40 local courts that we have to cover, mm -hmm. and so the court personnel have to cover them, and sometimes they're during the day, some of them are evening courts. Uh, so it's a, it's a major logistical issue for us with our 118 assistant district attorneys covering the county courthouse mm -hmm. uh, and as well as uh, all of the other uh, courts throughout the, throughout the county. Just so you know, Tony, I've often recommended that we merge um, some of our local courts. <laughs> we were able to do that in the village of Austin, town of Austin, because right. they were both the Austin court. We did do right. that. But there are a whole bunch of other courts I think we could um, merge. But that may not be under your, your well, jurisdiction. No. 
merging so. of those, and you, you and you know, you know, local communities are, are very uh, territorial about their right, about their area. Absolutely. Same same idea with people wanting to to merge the police departments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and Westchester can be a, l a little confusing, and not just the local municipalities, but fire districts go over different lines. School districts, you know, if you live in North Castle, you may be, be, have a Bedford address and, and your kids go to Armok schools and your your fire district is Banksville. You know, it's very, very confusing. You know, right. Mount Vernon is Mount Vernon. But, right. you know, when you're in northern Westchester, it can be very confusing. Right. And it's a law enforcement issue, too. Right. Well, it, it's uh, we don't realize how many people are, are um, involved in this in, in your office. The DA's office, how many employees do you have? Well, we have 118 assistant 18. district attorneys. Mm -hmm. Those, these are attorneys that serve at the pleasure of the district attorney. We have 35 investigators, uh, and they are responsible for assisting the assistant district attorneys in, in putting their cases together, but we also conduct our own investigations. Mm -hmm. um, within the, and then we have support personnel, of mm -hmm. course. Right. Uh, so we have a total of about 234, 235 uh, people. Our budget is, uh, you know, officially 27 million or so, mm -hmm. but that really doesn't count um, benefits. That's on the, under mm -hmm. a different budget mm -hmm. line, the county budget line. Right. I mean, if you put it all all together, uh, is we're probably more in the mid 30 million mm -hmm. dollar. Right. What is what is the? Um, uh, you, you have different things you have to do, but probably by state law, right? That the state law um, drive what kind of departments you have within the DA's office or can you be quite creative and develop your own areas of okay. expertise? Well, of course the state law, the penal law, is, is the driving force of, of the laws that we would be trying to enforce and mm -hmm. any laws in the, in the state of New York that are considered you know, uh, criminal activity, that's our, our mm -hmm. responsibility. Um, we have um, five divisions. Uh, we first, obviously, we have a trial division that try the felony cases. Mm -hmm. uh, we have local court and grand mm -hmm. jury uh, that cover the the branches, as we spoke about. We have an investigations division, and there we have within investigations we have different bureaus, uh, and they can be economic crimes, they could be gangs, guns, and narcotics. Um, it could be public integrity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, domestic violence is in a different group. That, that mm -hmm. comes under our special prosecution. That's another division. Um, and then we have administrative divisions. We have appeals. So, you know, we are, um, you know, it's a wonderful location for an attorney to be because not every attorney wants to be a, a trial attorney. Some mm -hmm. like legal mm -hmm. research and writing. Some like investigations. Mm -hmm. And we have a very uh, great opportunity for all of them to, to wherever their strengths are. If you're mm -hmm. a great writer, appeals and motions. If you are a person who likes to be in front of a jury, you have trials. And if you're a person who's a self-starter and likes to be involved in the investigations uh, that go on and that need to go on, mm -hmm. whether it be public integrity or gangs and guns and narcotics or whatever, there's a, you know, we have attorneys there too doing those, that type of work. How do you, how do you start the investigation or, or the, the public is watching this. So if, if, the public sees something that is wrong. Right. How do they reach out? Are they, are they okay. the ones many times where you get the initial information about a problem? Well, or? it comes in several different ways. Uh, sometimes they'll report it to their local police department. I think most of the mm -hmm. time people think that's their first line. If they right. see something okay. criminal, they're going to contact their local police department. And the local police department will conduct an investigation and, and sometimes make an arrest, and then the district attorney gets involved in it. Mm -hmm. Or we get involved because they say we're investigating it, we need a search warrant, and then mm -hmm. we get involved mm -hmm. in helping them prepare the case. Um, it depends on the police departments. You know, some need more help than others because when you have large communities like, let's say, Yonkers, they have a, a, a large police department, large detective bureau. But when you get to smaller communities, mm -hmm. they sometimes need our investigators to assist mm -hmm. them. So mm -hmm. back to the question, they, can, they report it to the police. We have a hotline uh, where people can call the district attorney's office. Um, and they can come in and, and just file a, a, a complaint and maybe we will then have them meet with one of our investigators if let's say they want to report some sort of public integrity type of mm -hmm. violation. Um, if they have concerns, if they're an elderly person who they feel they've been scammed. Uh, so they can come to us or they mm -hmm. can go to the local police departments. And on occasion, some, sometimes 
uh, folks are afraid to go to the local police department for one reason or another. Maybe they have an immigration issue and, and they feel it's better they want to reach out because we have a, an immigration group and mm -hmm. we have a mm -hmm. hotline there and we, we have... Uh, our, is that new? Is yes, that it is. I created new? it when, uh, when I, I got in. We created an immigrant affairs unit uh, that has the capability of, of speaking their language, willing to come to their location. Mm -hmm. uh, because, mm -hmm. I mean, we all know the, the immigrant community is being driven further and further underground, most of the time by the national rhetoric that's there. Um, they are uh, afraid to um, to be involved with law enforcement and the government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they are classic victims. Mm -hmm. um, they are victimized by members of their own community as well as people from outside their community because these these predators realize that these folks are generally afraid to report these crimes. Mm -hmm. They're worried about their right. status. And so it's, it's the continuing stories. It, it's, this is an age-old story. I mean, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it's ha been happened. It happened to, um, you know, my, my uh, ancestors that, that came here from Italy. I'm it, thinking about that because people came in and, I mean, I've had people call that they're not getting paid. Yes. Wage, wage theft, right. Wage theft. And, and we're wage involved theft. in that very much so with, matter of fact, the Department of Labor just was in our office uh, and award, gave us an award to people mm -hmm. uh, because of our efforts in that area. We re recoup millions of dollars for them. Um, they, it's, it, it's interesting how the dynamics have changed. Just be, it isn't just because they're, they're here and their immigration status is something that concerns them. People that come from foreign countries have come from a government that uh, they don't trust. Right. So right. even though the Italian Americans that came here at the turn of the century were here legally, mm -hmm. they were still <laughs> afraid of the police department and reporting things. Mm -hmm. And so they mm -hmm. became victims of people within their community taking advantage mm -hmm. of them and people from outside the community. Mm -hmm. Now for our, our, the, the present immigrant community that are here with, with uh, you know, documentation issues, mm -hmm. it's even more scary for them. Right. Uh, right. So they are, when they are victims, we need them to report the crimes against them or if mm -hmm. they are witnesses to crimes. We need them to come and assist us because that's mm -hmm. how we we um, prosecute cases. We need witnesses. We need victims. Right. And so, you know, it's, that's why we cr we created the Immigrant Affairs Unit. We go and we will visit them. We also mm -hmm. s go out and speak to uh, stakeholders that are involved in that community, trying to assure them that uh, we're not going to be reporting them to the immigration authorities mm -hmm. if uh, th we're here to try to help them. It, and it keeps getting more difficult uh, because of the activities recently, uh, you know, of, of, of ICE coming into the mm -hmm. courthouses. Yeah, our are victims are coming into the mm -hmm. courthouses. Our witnesses are coming into the courthouses. And, and they're hearing about uh, ICE coming in on, ci on civil arrests, mm -hmm. um, and they're afraid to come. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why new legislation we've been supporting you know, a, a safe court type of mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. legislation that's been presented to the legislature uh, because it is, uh, we can't do our job. And when, and when that community is taken advantage of, uh, it, it creates a situation where the entire community, all of Westchester mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, vulnerable. So, you know, we are, you know, very concerned about it. It's a major issue for, for, for us and for law enforcement in general. Right. Right. Because some of the issues, I'm just thinking, have you, I think you've done some other work in the domestic violence area oh, yeah. also, but that, that, you know, leads back to the immigration issue and, you know, people that have um, been victims of domestic violence not reporting because they're worried right. about it, but there are a lot of other victims of domestic violence. So that kind of comes through. Um, how, do you, how do you handle that? Is that a very complicated area? Well, the domestic violence, we have a whole a specialty group, you know, a group are special prosecutions. And mm -hmm. uh, they, these are attorneys that are specifically trained there. They have support personnel to help them. They have uh, connections with other stakeholders that can provide them with safe houses to go to. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, if, it, it's a huge network that through the district attorney's office that we have capable capabilities of referring people to, to get them into a safe location, to help mm -hmm. them with their problems, to get them advocates. Um, and yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, and there's the language issue, and mm -hmm. that you have, so you have to have assistant district attorneys and, and aides in the office that can assist you in that regard. Right, so they, when you're employing people, you really have to think about that. 
Well, it's, it's critical for yeah. us to, to it, it, on all different levels. You know, our, the, the district attorney's office has to reflect the community. Mm -hmm. um, and, but even more than that, if we have 20 or 25 percent of, uh, let's say 20 percent of the Westchester community, their first language is a, a foreign language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to try to have the capabilities of, of speaking that language and having people there to, to help them just like our law enforcement partners have to have that, that ability right. because they feel more comfortable speaking in their native language, many of them. So we've tried to expand that and it's, you know, you, you, you try, we have people that speak Italian, we have a lot uh, of we, different we languages purpose it, here, Spanish right? of course is very important. <laughs> right. uh, we have people that, that will speak other, you know, languages, it's, it's critical. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are a multitude of languages. We can't cover every language, but we, we, we try to do that. We have to keep an eye, our eye open for that. It's very important. And law enforcement is, is very important. You know, my friends in the FBI, they're very much interested in getting people that speak foreign mm -hmm. languages, Arabic, whatever it may right. be. Right. Um, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's what the community is. Mm -hmm. so. Now, the scammers, do they speak different languages? I'm thinking about the telephone scammers or other scammers. Well, I, <laughs> I always get it in English. Uh. Yeah, I, I, get it in, I, I get calls and, and sometimes I, I know this coming from a foreign country, you know, it's, yes, it's yes, from Africa. Yes. You could tell the language and what they're right. saying. Um, but, you know, they are out there big time and, and the, the, the seniors uh, are easily caught up in it. And, and I speak to people that have been attorneys and, and, and been involved in law enforcement. And, and they, these, these scams, some of them are so good that they mm -hmm, get caught mm -hmm. up on it. You know, calls right. that your grandson has, you know, been arrested and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, send us $5,000 and do this and do that. And they have a long story. Mm -hmm. um, I had I had one where I, I got a call, and they they said to me that um, we found a cell phone in, in the parking lot of Lord and Taylor, and um, I'd like to make arrangements for you to come and get it. And you know that sort of made sense to me because I have mm -hmm. a wife and three daughters, and I you know. Oh, they, this is your personal my story. personal phone. And oh, they, okay. And they and they, su <laughs> they support Lord and Taylor, so I, I think they kept it open, right, you know, right. for forever. And, um, and, but then I made my calls and I realized that wasn't so. Uh -huh. And, you know, of course, I, this was before I was DA and I, I, you know, reported to police because I was saying they were trying to connect with me for me to physically come down there. And I was trying to figure out what they had in mind. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, you never know what it is, but if people are calling you, asking for you for money, telling you that your electric electricity is going to be turned off or it's the right. IRS right. or the I'll Go buy those gift certificates and mail them to yeah. us or it, it, whatever. Yeah. Bitcoins and, yeah, yeah. Right, it kind of doesn't take gift cards, you know, right. just, just be aware of that. It's just so hard for people to, to always have this distrust of yeah. somebody on the phone. It, you know, our nature isn't that, so we're, I think we're much more trustworthy and we can just get roped into any of it's, these It's easy, when, especially when they're claiming members of your family are in, in harm's way, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is what they do. Um, and, and so, you know, we constantly put out alerts when we're aware of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we, we deal with... We so it comes with, when you do the alert, is that because there's been a lot of phone calls on this certain issue, you've seen a yeah. lot, so you just alert people we, we to it? We try to if, it be, if it's, it's something that we've become aware of. Sometimes, um, you know, they, they're reported to the local police department mm -hmm. and they're, they're mm -hmm. investigating it, but if we become aware of it, we will do alerts or, mm -hmm. or uh, other people will do alerts. Mm -hmm. The federal government mm -hmm. has, done, has done alerts. Um, you're just amazed at, at, with everybody knowing that these scams are going on, how many people still get roped in. Mm -hmm. But they, they do these, you know, robocalls. So, you know, all they have to do is, is hit one or two and, you know, it's a success. It right. costs them nothing. Right. I had a friend that was caught in London, lost her wallet, so to speak, and and she was at the embassy. And so I, I told the person, I, I emailed back and said, well, because she's near the embassy, call Nita Lowy, Congresswoman. <laughs> because she'd have a contact there. So this person who's doing the scam probably thought, this lady is really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, but I was had, and, my, and, and I remember my son saying, oh, mom, you just, you just did it. You, you bought right into it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, well, let's talk about the drugs and the opioids and Correct. all of those issues. I mean, that, the, the drug use just has to have such an, unfortunately, a very negative impact on your office in the sense of what you have to deal with. Well, you know, 
we've been involved in the war on drugs for 100 years. And back in the 80s, when I was uh, sitting in the special narcotics part, it was Actually, crack cocaine. That's true. That's true. Um, right. now, it just changes. Now right? we have <clears throat> the opioid crisis. And in, from 2015 to 2016, there was a, a, a double, double, uh, an increase with doubled, like 200 percent, the number of overdoses. Um, and then we've been, we created a, a, a task force, a joint task force with mm -hmm. the county police, putting several of our investigators, county police investigators, uh, analysts from the Westchester Intelligence Center to help local police departments. And we're trying to see, you know, what sort of success we can have. And we've been having a, a lot of success in trying to address it, but still it's on the rise. Um, I would say from 2016 to 2017, we had approximately, um, let's say, 147 overdoses uh, in the county, of which mm -hmm. maybe, you know, 47 or so were um, fatal. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. last year, in the, within the same period, we were up to, let's say, 157. These numbers are very mm -hmm. close, mm -hmm. with maybe, um, you know, 50. Mm -hmm. um, when we did the numbers, there was about a 6% increase right. um, in, on both overdose numbers and as well as fatalities. Narcan has been very successful, and these are just, mm -hmm, the, just mm -hmm. the ones that are reported to us. Right, right. You, you know, you just don't know which of, one you're missing. There are probably a lot of saves with Narcan Correct. that may not get reported. And it, and it has been of, of tremendous, of tremendous value. Um, so the other thing is, though, these, these overdoses are occurring, the numbers are going to be 27 to 30 different communities in Westchester. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people can't sit back and say, oh, it's not in my community. Right. It is everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you'd be very surprised when you look at some of the statistics where there were, you know, per, per, if you looked at the number of people that lived in that area and the number of overdoses as compared to a more populous community, mm -hmm. how much, you know, the, the difference, you'd be surprised. You might think it was going to happen in the more populous areas and there was more up in, let's say, northern mm -hmm. Westchester. Mm -hmm. So it is something that we, we created this, this task force. Uh, we've, we are trying to, when we, we do have an overdose and there's a fatality, we are, are not just treating it as an accidental fatality, we are trying to treat it almost as a homicide investigation so we can see and try to track down where these where narcotics came from, look at the product that's there, um, and, and see if we can uh, trace it and to assist us in our our operations and we are um, vigorously uh, you know working these cases and but it but it sounds like it just doesn't uh, this there's so little improvement even when you I mean there's so many people that have been helped but it still just keeps going on it, and it on, is but but right? let's let yes you, you know mm -hmm. we the numbers are still increasing but if the if Three years ago, it was a 100 or 200 percent increase from right, year to year, right, that's and now true. we're down to five percent right, to six percent. Right. We're we're right. closing the gap on it, um, but it is a continuing battle, and mm -hmm. and the battle is always has to be fought um, from a lot of different ends. First of all, what's making the, the, these drugs so dangerous is that they're the fentanyl that's in it. Fentanyl mm -hmm. is a hundred times more powerful. You just need a little bit of it in it, and, and mm -hmm. people that take it, most of them will immediately overdose. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of counterfeit drugs out there. So it's a young person who is uh, taking, uh, you know, drugs, painkillers from their, uh, you know, their house, mm -hmm. their the medicine parents cabinet, have it, the right. medicine cabinet, yep. and they think they can handle it when they get a counterfeit. Um, they think they can handle it, but it's, if it's if it's counterfeit and slaced with fentanyl they were going to overdose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it is um, something that is, you know, very serious and, and very concerning to us. But we are trying to make progress. But at the same time, w you can't just bail the boat out, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. You have to stick your finger in the bottom of the boat and stop the water from coming in right. as you bail it out. And where is it, where are most of the drugs coming in? Are, are we on a, on a line on a railroad from the city or... Virginia, no, uh, or well, do we have any idea? They, they come yes. from South America and coming up through Mexico and coming up the I-95 corridor. Mm -hmm, and they can mm -hmm. be transported, mm -hmm. you know, from there. Some have come in um, from Asia, and somehow or other they'll, they'll come in. Uh, some from Canada. Um, you know, it, they're very creative on how they, they do these things. And, you know, of course, 
we deal with what, what is occurring in our location, but it's the, the, the DEA and the federal authorities that have to be involved in, mm -hmm. you know, what, what is going on. Um, but, but we work at, at the local level, and then we try to conduct our investigations more detailed to try to move it up from the person on the street to the person that they're getting supplied by to mm -hmm. the person they're getting supplied by. And mm -hmm. usually the one step up is New York City. Mm -hmm. That's where mm -hmm. it's coming in from the Bronx or wherever it may be. And then where are they getting it from? Right. And it, now we're getting outside my, our jurisdiction. Right. But it's interesting, Tim, because some people think that, you know, you should just um, pick up the person who's who's been on the street selling it. But my understanding is you really, as you said, you want you you want to find the real seller. Yes, um, you want the can. main supplier. You, so you do try to work your, your way up. But right. you know, look, we 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 do uh, undercover operations. We do undercover mm -hmm. buys, and we get those folks. But from that mm -hmm. information, we also try to track up the line through mm -hmm. our different mm -hmm. investigative techniques, which I'm not going to talk about. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, well, let's. What are, what are some other? I mean, mail theft. That's yeah. a new one. Wow. Well, it Isn't was. It new? It's I mean, a, we're doing a good job now. But uh -huh. you know what happened was it, it came with it, it. It came to us first. It was happening in the Bronx mm -hmm. um, and New York I City didn't that. Um, when they the, the postal service jumped on in New York City and changed the the boxes and made them more difficult. To, a little. To take you in. put a little slip in instead of pulling the whole thing down. There were a lot of things that were going yes. on. First of all, yeah, they could go fishing. They could uh -huh. put like a, a sticky stuff and go down there and pull things out. Right. But the one that, thing that was concerning us is that they were getting keys to the boxes and that they were coming from within the postal right. service. Right. So there were employees involved. Right. Um, after they changed all the boxes and made it more difficult in the Bronx, you know, the bad people said, okay, let's come to Westchester. Mm -hmm. And they started mm -hmm. doing it in Westchester. And, um, you know, the we reached out to uh, the postal inspectors, and, and we reached out to Nita Lowy and to our legislators and everyone starting to raise hell that, mm -hmm. you know, they had insufficient resources to try to address this. Um, we, we had local police departments surveilling them and making arrests. But the problem is tampering with the mail is a federal crime. It's a mm -hmm. felony in, in the federal law. Mm -hmm. But in, under state law, it's we all we could usually get them with, with is if that they tampered with the box. Well, how much did they oh, damage the box? Okay. It was a, a scratch. Right. Did they break a lock. It, oh. it's a so misdemeanor. do we need legislation on that? We, we have think federal about it. legislation. The I know. It's a federal case. Right. If we caught them and they had the checks, now we have them in possession oh, okay. of, of stolen property, forged instruments, doing things like that, and we could turn it into felonies. By our bringing it to the attention and, and, and screaming out about it, we did mm -hmm. get more resources in and things have subsided. We have made arrests, we have indictments, we have sent some people to jail and the feds mm -hmm. have jumped on it uh, on their own. And so that epidemic has slowed down now so. and right, it's sort of right. disappeared. Right. Um, but and they then, had to change all the boxes right. so that they weren't easy as right. easy to it's get It's amazing. Into. Uh, there's always something new that comes along and then, you know, we're concluding, but just the uh, people stealing the packages at your front door. <laughs> That's yes. another one that just started, but we, we but don't the, have time to get into that. But I will but. say one thing about some of these mail thefts and some of these activities and identity thefts that are occurring. Mm -hmm. The, there are gangs that have moved away from the more of some of the violent crimes and moved mm -hmm. into these areas and mm -hmm. they become very sophisticated and mm -hmm. they steal your identity and then they go out and they create uh, bank accounts and they'll go out and buy cars and if you, if you recall not too long ago we, we busted a, a whole group that were involved in going to Lexus dealers and other dealerships high-end cars right, and, right. and with phony identification right. getting and, and getting cars and then taking those cars and bringing right. them to cargo carriers to send them to Africa. Right. So well, you have a lot of work to do, always, <laughs> and unfortunately there's so many more activities, but I just want to thank you for being here today, Tony, and for the audience, um, just if you have any questions, just give us a phone call, 914-941-1111. Thank you so much for watching.